Okay. Wow. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get started. I'd like you to take your seats, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start. Please take your seats. If there's an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand? If there's an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand so folks have an opportunity to go ahead and have a seat? Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Thaddeus Cohen, I'm the Growth Management Director uh, here at Collier County, and I wanna welcome you to our Red Tide Information Public Meeting. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, for us to get more understanding about the issues surrounding Red Tide that you've seen in the paper recently. And, and I wanna start by first thanking uh, Commissioner Taylor and Commissioner Solis uh, for bringing us together. It was their initiative, their idea, to be able to have this forum. So if you could, I hear that round of applause. Let's <laughs> and, and, and as you know, th this affects uh, not just us here in Collier County, uh, but our neighbors to the north in Lee County. And I know that today we have a number of elected officials here as well. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Elaine Sarlo, excuse me, Sarlo, Senator Rubio's aide. She's in attendance. Uh, Senator Pasadomo, she's here. And there's a series of elected officials that I'd like you to stand and introduce yourself to the public so that uh, folks can see the interest that you have in being here. So if you would please stand and give us all a shout out. Local elected officials. Oh, we'll do our best, go ahead. Sir? Howard Reed, Marco Island City Council. Any others? Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, let me just kind of give you an outline as to what today's program is gonna be. You have it on your list there. Uh, Commissioner Taylor will introduce our speakers. Uh, we've limited the speakers each to 10 minutes because we know that your time is valuable. Uh, some of these folks are academics and we know that they could ramble on for those of you who went to college can <laughs> kind of remember how that would go. So we're kind of confining them to a, a, a brief presentation. And then at the end, uh, we'll have a question and answer. And in order to make it productive, we've asked you to fill out the cards. Uh, they'll be collected and we'll try to group those questions that are similar together and then have our panelists go forward and answer them. And I think if we're able to do that, uh, that'll provide the maximum opportunity for all of you to have your questions answered as well as give the panelists an opportunity to opine on uh, the various issues that are facing us here today. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, you can see where the exits are, so please uh, be aware of those. If the restrooms, they're behind me in the back. If those who need to make that stop during the course of today's presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Commissioner Taylor, who will then move forward with the uh, uh, announcements of each of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Just another note of housekeeping. We are ladies and gentlemen listening to ladies and gentlemen. And I would ask you, this is a very emotional topic for me, and I'm sure it's very emotional for you. But these folks are gonna give us information and so let's be respectful, let's listen. Um, they're gonna give you sources of, of, of being able to source this information after this meeting is over. If there's interest, we'll do it again, okay? We're here to work with you. We know we have elected officials engaged and that's, that's the most important thing. Hang on for one, yes, yes. No one's screening any questions from the public because that is the best efficiency of, of time here. Nothing is screening. In fact, if you'd like to see all the note cards at the back, we'd be glad to give them to you. Leave them out there for people to read. First, let's, and if you could rise and just as I speak about you, just briefly so people know or put your hand up. Dr. Vince Lofko, he's the staff scientist and program manager of phytoplankton ecology with Moat Marine. Did I do that all right? That was great. Okay. 
Dr. Tracy Fanara is the staff scientist and program manager of environmental health with NARC. Thank you. Dr. Richard Pierce, I heard him the other day on national news in about a 20 minute interview, is the senior scientist for exo, uh -oh, exo ecotoxicology. Ecotoxicology, eco, eco toxicology and associate vice president for research at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. Rhonda Watkins is the principal environmental specialist with Collier County Pollution Control. Phil Flood, he serves as the regional representative at the South Florida Water Management District's Fort Myers, Fort Myers Service Center. Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds, she's with the Army Corps of Engineers. We're very glad she's here this evening. Jennifer Leeds is the Section Administrator <coughs> in the Everglades Policy and Coordination Office. And Dr. Bill Mitch, who is the eminent scholar and director of Everglades Wetland Research Park and the Juliet C. Sproul Chair for Southwest Florida Habitat Restoration at Florida Gulf Coast University, will be uh, brought to us through Skype. So without um, any more delay, I'd like to hear, I believe, from Moat Marine. Please begin. Thank you. Thank you. This, we've got quite an echo here because I've got something that I'm worried about. Thank you very much. It's indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight to share with you what we know and what we're doing about Red Tide. And we're going to do a quick little tag team. I'm going to start just giving an overview, something about Red Tide, and then my area is the toxin. So we're going to talk about that. And then we'll go to uh, Dr. Loveco, who is the phytoplankton specialist, and then Dr. Fanero, who's the environmental engineer plus a specialist in information outreach. And so she's going to, we always save the best for last, so we'll get moving here. Oh, is there a way to turn the lights down so we can see the slide? Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, Mobring Laboratory is an independent, not-for-profit research in, and education organization. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, 24 different research programs in all areas of, of marine science, and about uh, seven or eight of us uh, are involved in the red tide specifically, and others uh, partially, and it, we don't just do red tide, we do a lot of other things as well. So uh, I'm beginning it, and then uh, Dr. Loveco, the phytoplankton ecology, and uh, Dr. Fanera in environmental health. We also have what used to be called environmental chemistry, uh, chemical and physical ecology, coral reef monitoring, and ocean technology all involved. Uh, MOAT has many research partners. Our primary funding for Red Tide is our partnership with State Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. That is a base of funding, which is very important, primarily focused on the public health and environmental health and understanding how we can get the information to the public to help mitigate adverse effects uh, for them. Uh, but we use that program to leverage additional funding because you never have enough money to do all the research you want to do. And that allows us to interact with many partners, and these are some of the primary <coughs> partners that we work with, as well as various universities, uh, Florida Gulf Coast, of course, one of them, and then many private donors. Philanthropic uh, additions to our finances are extremely important for us to do the work that we do. Topics today would be, uh, we're focusing with our uh, state funding on the public health and information, and then also to re reduce the adverse impacts on public health, coastal marine ecosystems, and of course, the Florida economy. To accomplish the goals, we need to know the question, what is red tide? How is it harmful? What causes red tide to start? How can we get rid of it? And what can we do about it? So first of all, as most of you know, red tide is a microscopic alga, a photosynthetic dinoflagellate. That's a little Photo, uh, photograph of it there. Um, it's a harmful algal bloom, a HAB, an, in high concentrations. Uh, it causes harm, and worldwide there's over 2,000 species of marine algae, and over 200 species are known to be harmful in one way or another. And Dr. Lovko will expand on that. So why is it harmful? Well, it's harmful because it produces some very potent neurotoxins. And these affect the nervous system in just about the same way that some pesticides do. Uh, it is not a bacterium, it does not infect people, but the toxins uh, are, in essence, poisonous. Uh, the mode of action, it, it affects the nervous system, it also causes bronchial constriction. This is the toxins, not the organism. And uh, you can, it can cause asthmatic attack, and it also in, inhibits immune function. 
So let's do some brief facts about it. Uh, it occurs naturally in the Gulf. It's always present out there in low numbers, maybe a few to a uh, thousand cells per liter or per quart. Uh, so the background concentrations, there's very few toxins available, so it's not a problem. But when you get high concentrations, as we have now in millions of cells per liter or per quart, uh, you got a lot of toxins, and so you got a lot of problems. Uh, the shellfish closer is only at 5,000 cells per liter because clams and oysters accumulate, they filter feed the organism, and as they do that, they filter feed the toxins and accumulate very high levels. So the state does an excellent job in protecting public health from um, contaminated shellfish. Just briefly, this shows kind of a brief overview. The red tide cells are not to uh, proper order there, scale. Uh, Whenever the cells break apart, the toxins are released in the water. They get in through the fish gills. Another way the, you can, the fish get them are through the food chain. And of course, then they absorb to, uh, they're not, the toxins are not very soluble. So they absorb to surfaces like bubbles and that puts them up in the air. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the public health effects from air, first of all, there's two main effects, the aerosolized toxins and then it, from seafood. Inhalation, dry choking cough, and the physical irritation, burning eyes and nose. How many people have experienced the red tide effects from aerosol? Okay, we're all in good, good company here. Uh, the way it is, bubble mediated transport, the toxins absorbed to the surface of the bubbles. They're concentrated as they go through, and when they burst, and, and you can see the little jet drops going up in the air with toxins. We collected those and found 50 times the amount of toxin per unit water in the droplets as there were in the water. So they're a very efficient mechanism for concentrating it. And then the wind blows them into our nose and eyes and throat. Uh, the other way of, of affecting humans is the seafood contamination called neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Uh, and that is uh, multiple neurological and gastrointestinal effects, N nausea, numbness, and tingling from the neur neurological feels like you're bitten bit by ants, you lose uh, coordination, hot and cold sensations reversed, slurred speech, uh, pupil dilation, disoriented, possibly as though you were intoxicated, uh, chest heaviness, respiration distress. Recovery, recovery from eating the shellfish generally in about three days to a week, but some very severe have to be put on a ventilator so your lungs can keep functioning. Marine mammals and sea turtles, of course, we know that dolphins, manatees, sea turtles, seabirds, primarily from what they eat. They eat things that accumulate the toxin and they get then become uh, neurological and gastrointestinally affected. We do a lot of monitoring. It required, if you're gonna know your enemy, you gotta do a lot of monitoring on it. Uh, right now we're doing uh, new autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, drones, one of the, Dr. Lovko's main things. And also we work with NOAA and NASA to have satellite imagery so that we know where the blooms are based on the chlorophyll and then we can send our little robotics out there to, to find out if it really is red tide. Uh, today, a lot of our monitoring is on board ship. We collect the samples, bring them back to the lab, and then we use sophisticated uh, high performance liquid chromatography <coughs> with mass spectroscopy to identify the toxins. For the future, we're working on a special DNA based uh, handheld sensor that will identify the toxins in the field. A five minute deal, you uh, react insert it in the cartridge and you get a reading and it will save a lot of time and a lot of money and most importantly, especially for clam farmers, it will help them to identify if in fact the red tide is in their area and not just five miles down, down the bay. Uh, we're also working on new technology to be sensors out in the Gulf and along the coast uh, for red tide detection. This is called the Programmable Hyperspectral Seawater Scanner or the FIS. Uh, so uh, we, we have them just now uh, for fixed uh, moorings, but we're working on another one that will go on our autonomous underwater vehicle. So we have a lot of information or requests about control. The question is, can we do it? And if we can, should we? We have to remember this is part of a natural ecosystem, part of the natural phytoplankton ecology. Mitigation means to reduce and avoid the impacts. Control means to stop the growth or the development of the toxin. Whatever we do has to be ecologically sound, economically feasible, and logistically attainable. So just briefly then, if we're looking at mitigation and control, we have to do the monitoring so that we can predict and provide early warning, and then our response is to prepare and then to protect. There's a lot of chemicals that'll kill the red tide, but they'll also kill a lot of other things and mess up the ecosystem. 
Yeah, our biological control is another area that we're looking at, and also physical control, clay flocculation, freshwater, air bubbles. So all of these things we're trying in different, different ways, trying to think outside the box and do monitor to know where it is, what it's doing, and then start applying some of these. One area that we have just begun to use is uh, ozone. We use ozone in our aquarium to purify the water. We bring seawater in from New Paths into the aquarium. We have to get rid of all the eggs and larvae and things, little critters that want to grow in there. Uh, we also bring that water in, in it, when it has red tide in it, we have to treat it. So we use a special ozone processing that is patented by Moat for our marine mammal and sea turtle hospital. Uh, the way it works is we bring the seawater into a contact unit and we inject the ozone at a very high energy so that it's completely mixed. The, the ozone will kill the red tide cells, it will destroy the toxin and it reoxygenates the water and then the purified water goes into the tank. So we looked at and, and said, why can't we do that in a canal that has been totally putrefied by red tide? Well, this is what we found when we brought it into the tank. This was when we started at looking at the bottom of the tube tank and this was 12 hours later. So it worked quite well, all the red tide and toxins were gone. So last week we were able to get permission from DEP and the Army Corps to do a test, uh, just an experiment in part of a canal in Boca Grande and this just shows the setup. Uh, monitoring, we, we ran it for four days and we're still monitoring all the data. But we found out number one, a putrefied canal full of red tide and dead fish is a lot different than a, than a swimming pool with, <laughs> with red tide in it. But we learned a lot from it and we're moving forward and uh, we're excited about actually able to do something about mitigating the red tide and maybe making a safe place for fish and manatees to go when they're in the middle of a red tide, plus alleviating some of the aesthetic and health problems of the residential canal. With that, let me uh, let um, Dr. Lovko come up and um, tell you a lot about the organism and other types of harmful algal blooms. Thank you, Rich, and thanks everybody for being here tonight. We're gonna go a little little broader, a little more general now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, a brief background of harmful algal blooms, not just red tide, but a little bit of an overview about what a harmful algal bloom is and some of the other ones we have in Florida, um, briefly. And then a little bit of a history of red tide in Florida. And then we'll get a little bit into uh, what causes red tide, since that is the main thing we're here to talk about. So first of all, what is a harmful algal bloom? I think to understand that, we have to back up a little bit and ask, you know, what, what are they composed of? So they're, they're made of phytoplankton. So what are phytoplankton? <clears throat> they're they're single-celled photosynthetic organisms, and they're really important in our uh, ecology, in our ecosystem. There's a lot of different kinds. They're very taxonomically diverse, which means there's a lot of different groups and species and families, and they're as different from each other as we are from, say, a fungus. And they need uh, nutrients and sunlight to grow. I think we all probably understand that. They're plant-like in that way. And uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're important. They're the base of the food web, which means they exist. Other grazers eat them, little zooplankton, small fish eat the grazers and so forth up the food chain so that we have a, that, so that we have a productive fishery, so that we have fish to eat. Um, so they're very important components of the ecosystem. They actually conduct about 90% of the photosynthesis that occurs in the ocean, and they produce about 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. So roughly for every three breaths of air you, you three breaths you take, you can thank uh, phytoplankton for the oxygen in two of them. But of course, excessive growth and also physical concentration of these, these cells can cause what we refer to as a bloom. And it's, a, it's often a combination of factors, both biological or three components, biological, chemical, and physical, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. So an algal bloom versus a harmful algal bloom. So phytoplankton are not inherently bad. We need them, as I hopefully have established a little bit briefly. I mean, even blooms of, of phytoplankton are not necessarily bad. Uh, the picture down there on the extreme left uh, shows the uh, annual diatom bloom that occur occurs in the North Atlantic. That's really important for the fisheries in the North Atlantic. We, we need to have that. The other, the middle one shows a bloom in a lake that's, that's not natural and, and of course you can see a, a very bad, uh, a different type of red tide um, in China on the, on the extreme right. So a bloom is defined by cell numbers. That means you have a, a high <coughs> concentration of cells. Oftentimes that'll discolor the water but it doesn't always discolor the water. 
Harmful is defined by the effect if it has a negative effect. And we have several, around the world, we have a number of different kinds of harmful algal blooms. This shows some of the ones we have in this country, in the US. I won't try to go through all of them, but just to show you the diversity. And pretty much every, every coastline is affected by some sort of harmful algal bloom. And that's not true only in the US, but also worldwide. You can see our, our, uh, our friend and nemesis, Karenia brevis, down there in the Gulf of Mexico. So, okay, so back to what is a harmful algal bloom. So some of the harmful effects that we see in these, these, these bad players in the phytoplankton world when they uh, occur in high enough concentrations, um, it's not always toxin. Um, that's often what we in the harmful algal research community often think of, but there are, there are other ways of being harmful. Uh, just excess biomass just from a lot of these organisms that can block sunlight and they can foul shorelines. They can also, as that bloom dies, the decomposition of it uses oxygen. That can cause low oxygen often in the bottom waters and some areas you've probably heard of, the Gulf of Mexico has one in the northern Gulf called a dead zone. And that's again due to that excess biomass of phytoplankton decomposing using up oxygen. <clears throat> and then of course you can have a production of toxins. We call them phycotoxins when they're produced by phytoplankton. And collectively all of these things are known as harmful algal blooms or, or HABs as we call them for short. So in Florida, we have a, a few, more than just Carinia brevis, um, but of course that is the one a lot of us are most familiar with. We also have uh, cyanobacterial blooms that occur in fresh and sometimes in brackish water, and we'll touch on that briefly, shortly. And then uh, another one, uh, th this name might confuse some of you that have read the press lately, but there's something that we refer to as a brown tie, which is a whole nother group of organisms. And we'll touch on all of these. And there are other blooms as well, some harmful, some not. Uh, but some of the main ones, so the freshwater cyanobacterial blooms, um, these are caused by an ancient group of, of photosynthetic bacteria. So there's a bacteria that can use sunlight to make their food much like a plant does. Um, and this often is a result of excess uh, nutrients in the water and freshwater bodies. And there have been recent blooms, as I'm sure everybody is aware, uh, that often start in Lake Okeechobee and end up in the Caloosahatchee and uh, St. River, uh, St. Lucie River uh, system. And those have occurred in 2005, 13, 16, and of course the one that's uh, currently going on in the Caloosahatchee and the St. Lucie system uh, this year. And uh, the cyanobacteria are complex because the, the community of these cyanobacteria is very diverse. You can have a lot of different species in one bloom, and some of those produce toxin and some of those do not. Some of the ones that produce toxin sometimes produce toxin and sometimes do not. So it makes it for a very complex problem. And there's a lot of different toxins they can produce well, as well. I have a few of them listed here. Hepatotoxins, which tend to affect the liver, such as microcystin. Uh, also neurotoxins and dermatoxins. All right, so uh, in addition to the freshwater cyanobacteria, and it's important to try to make this distinction, we also have marine cyanobacteria. Now in freshwater, the cyanobacteria are very diverse. There's you know, thousands of different species of cyanobacteria. In our marine system, there's really only a handful um, that are of any significance, and not many of them bloom. Uh, locally, in, here in Florida, on the West Florida Shelf, one of them that does bloom is called Trichodesmium. You might have seen it in the, in the press lately. It's been getting some attention. Uh, so these generally form annual blooms on the coast of Florida, uh, typically offshore, and there's a reason for that. So they're, uh, they're generally non-toxic, and they're also nitrogen fixers. So what that means is they take nitrogen out of the air. This is a good bonus for them, so they can grow in areas where there aren't many nutrients, because they can pull their nitrogen out of the air. And uh, they may play a role in Carinia brevis blooms, and the, the reason is because they're bringing new nitrogen into the system. And that brings nitrogen into, a, into an area of the, of the water where we believe Carinia brevis uh, initiates the blooms. Um, these blooms, you, may, many of you may have seen them. They've been known as uh, sailor sawdust or sea sawdust because these, the cells, the individual cells, stack together to form a filament. Those filaments combine together to form a tuft. And these tufts, when they're healthy, float at the top of the surface of the water. And they look kind of like a, a grain of sawdust. And so that hence the name. And then old degraded blooms can eventually get blown to shore and wash up and they're, they're degraded at that point and they can kind of look and smell foul and scummy and kind of like an oil slick. Um, so in the press recently, it's been referred, the trichodesmium has been referred to as a brown tide. Um, mistakenly, I mean, I guess because it's brown, but um, those of us that work on harmful algae, we know of another group of organisms that we refer to as brown tide. These are golden brown algae, also called pelagophytes. And here on the east coast of Florida, 
um, on the other side uh, in the, some of the saltwater lagoons, such as the Banana River Lagoon and the Indian River Lagoon, we have this species called Oria umbra lagunensis. Um, it's non-toxic, but it can produce a huge amount of biomass, um, probably because of excess nutrients in those lagoons. Um, as I mentioned before, that excess biomass can block sunlight, which isn't so good for seagrasses, and can also deplete oxygen, which can therefore kill fish. Um, it's interesting because this uh, organism was first noticed in Florida in 2005, wasn't really recorded prior to that, and the first bloom was recorded in 2012. So it may be that it does occur naturally and just kind of had the right conditions to finally start blooming, or it may have been introduced uh, via ballast water. And uh, there has been recent blooms uh, two years ago that were quite extensive. And of course, we're all familiar with red tide. I won't go into it too much. Rich, uh, Dr. Pierce gave uh, quite a, a good thorough overview of, of uh, Karenia brevis. And recently, in the past about, you know, about a decade, a little bit more, um, we've had some pretty significant blooms. In 2004 through 2006, there was a 17 or 18 month bloom, a pretty severe one in 2012 and 13. Uh, we had one in the Big Bend area in 2014. It was a huge bloom, but a lot of people didn't know about it because it didn't come to the coast. And then uh, the past several years, we've had uh, blooms in a row, uh, 15, 16, 16, 17, and of course, the one that started back in October and is still continuing now. So I have a little dot, 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 because we don't quite know when it's going to end. Um, hopefully, there won't be a 2017 through 2019. And of course, the, uh, the main negative effects there from this red tide is because of the production of that neurotoxin called brevitoxin. So I wanted to give a little history of red tide. A lot of you have probably heard, um, maybe even some of us and, and other seen it in the press and hear scientists say how it's natural and it's been here a long time. Well, we say that because that's, that's what the evidence shows us. And uh, as far back as the 1500s, a Spanish explorer um, actually published stories from Native Americans. He published a book, this was published in 1542, uh, that describes these red blooms and, or these, this red water that didn't know what caused it, of course, and dead fish and birds and so forth. Um, in 1844 was the first like, documented red tide. Again, we still didn't know the organism, but the, the description of these events fits what we see today. And um, in 1878, started a, a very long period of, red, of consistent red tides that lasted for approximately a decade. Now, this doesn't mean one bloom that lasted for 10 years, but consistent blooms year after year. And uh, I won't try to read through all of these. Um, in 1884 was the first uh, reported incidence of somebody getting sick from ingesting shellfish contaminated with red tide. And then in 1947, as a special case, there was a, a very severe bloom that lasted about a year and um, what was important here is that this is when we finally found out what caused red tide. Um, some scientists were brought in from Miami and Woods Hole, um, collected water, did a bunch of tests. Some of the tests were um, kind of funny for the day, which included like squirting some of the culture, the cultured organism into people's noses. We wouldn't really get away with that these days. Um, but that's how they found out it was caused by Karenia brevis, and that's when the organism was, was identified. It was originally called Gymnodinium breve, and went through, or Tychodiscus actually, went through a, well, I, I guess that was a second. Anyways, it went through a lot of name changes. We now call it Karenia brevis. And then uh, in 53, we had uh, what at that time was the longest recorded uh, bloom of 18 months. Um, in 1994, we had a bloom that, the start of a bloom that actually lasted nearly 20 months. And uh, in 1994, uh, or 1996, we had a bloom that lasted uh, into uh, 97. So, um, so those are prior to a decade ago. So we had bad, bad blooms. So the, you know, not only is the organism we believe to be you know, endemic or, or native to here, at least for a long time, but also these events of red tide. So what causes Florida red tide? Just got a couple of slides left. I'm gonna be brief here, but there's multiple factors that, that play into initiation, because when you think about causing a red tide, there's the initiation, and then there's propagation, which means while it's growing. So something first causes it to start growing, something allows it to keep growing, and then something maintains it once it's grown. And then eventually there's termination. So there's a lot of complex biological interactions. There's competition with other phytoplankton. I tried to establish that there's a lot of different species out there, and there are many of them, and they're all competing for the same resources. And then there's also other things you have to deal with. They're be, trying to be eaten by, by zooplankton. And uh, of course, there's nutrients of many types and many sources, and I'll touch on that briefly in the next slide. 
And then there's physical circulation, like the movement of the water that carries these particles, these cells along with it. So here's a, a graphic that Dr. Pierce put together that shows some of the nutrient sources. Um, you can see there's atmospheric inputs. Um, there's the trichodesmium that I mentioned that might play a role in initiation of perennia brevis, maybe even maintenance. Um, that's believed to be fed by the Saharan dust, which brings iron that that particular organism needs to pull that, that nitrogen out of the air. Um, there's uh, nutrients from deep water and also from sediments. There's nutrients from land that are both, include both natural sources and potentially man-made uh, human-derived sources as well. Um, discharges out of the estuaries, which again can be both natural and man-made. Um, decayed organisms that can pr provide uh, nutrients. And uh, even the sloppy feeding of zooplankton. When these grazers are eating all these phytoplankton, they can be sloppy and leave a lot of things behind that can be nutrient sources. And even atmospheric <coughs> deposition. And there's several others as well. So as far as physical bloom movement and development, um, you know, a few, a few different factors play in. Uh, temperature, salinity, uh, there's the water density. We believe stratification plays a role. That means the separation of water masses from surface and bottom because of the density of the water. And, um, <clears throat> and also, of course, the currents and circulation patterns. And the image shown there, um, or both of these images, show a bloom uh, in January of, of 2005. Uh, where the initial bloom observation via satellite, um, that's that uh, red area there is, is what's believed to be a bloom at the surface. Well, only uh, one month later, um, that, that little bit of bloom expanded to over uh, 4,000 square miles in only about 30 days. And what, what that helps us understand, you may also have heard if you've been paying attention to this overall story, that our current understanding is that initiation occurs offshore. Um, probably near the bottom due to some sort of nutrient source that triggers the, the initial growth and development of these, of these blooms. And then they move towards the shore and get pushed up at the surface. And this was uh, a Bob Weisberg from USF. Uh, he had a paper in 2006 that helped, helped establish uh, or further establish this. It's been a notion for a long time. And um, that is all I have. And I will turn it over to Dr. Fanat. Uh, while the doctor is coming up, I'd like to uh, announce that Representative Bob Rommel is here, and, and thank you for attending. Uh, the other is, if you have questions, uh, some of them I'm seeing are being answered by the presenters, but if you do have questions, kind of put your card up and we can collect them. We appreciate that. Uh, Naples City Council, Rich Buxton is here as well. Thank you for attending. Everybody. My name is Dr. Tracy Fanara, and I am an environmental engineer and a diehard gator. Do I have any gators? Yeah. Nice. Um, and at Moat, I am the only engineer, and I and I saw this clearly when I when it came to March Madness at my the engineering firm that I worked at. Actually, I worked at a few. I worked as a project engineer for about a decade before getting my PhD. Um, but we would do March Madness, and every single day there would be statistics, hourly even, and I would know exactly where I where where I landed, what my chances were to get to get to the top, and uh, I started at Moat, and it was like basketball didn't exist, <laughs> and so that's that's my best description on the difference between engineers and scientists. <laughs> so. At Moat Marine Laboratory, I run the environmental health program. So we look at ways that we, we affect the environment, how the environment affects us, try to communicate those impacts, and then design, develop ways to mitigate and alleviate those impacts. So at Moat Marine Laboratory, we have five different groups working on red tide research and, and pretty much all kind of comes down to me to that uh, education outreach. And as I said, I'm an engineer, so I'm solution-based. Uh, the whole monitoring thing and looking at stuff is great, but I like to take that information and do something with it. And, and with red tide being, being something that occurs every single year and something that would occur whether we were here or not, it was 
kind of overwhelming because I really wanted to just solve it, end it. Um, so, so the best thing that I could do is develop and design innovative ways to get that information to the public to try to protect public health. So have you guys heard of the Beach Conditions Reporting System? Okay, so that's, that's wonderful to hear. So we have uh, Gulf Coast beaches reporting red tide effects like dead fish, respiratory irritation, and, uh, and water discoloration. This was first developed in 2006 by Mo to, for this purpose. Uh, when I got here in 2015, my first job was to redevelop this. And one thing that was really important to me was that uh, it included beach conditions that anybody would want to know going to a beach because I wanted to, people to be in the habit of, of going to the BCRS. So we have trained beach sentinels at each location reporting, volunteers reporting twice daily, which is pretty amazing, and we're just so grateful for them. Um, this is an example of a report, and uh, of course links to get more information. Uh, we've seen over, this is actually a couple weeks old now, over 1.4 million page visits since October to the BCRS. And we have people from all over the world um, checking, checking the BCRS when they come to Florida, which is pretty awesome. Um, then we have Habscope, which we're pretty excited about. And they actually have one here at, at Collier County, and you can check it out after. Um, it's a NASA-funded project that we are contracted on by NOAA and GCUS. So basically, we train volunteers to take the cell phone microscope out to the beach. They take a sample, put the sample underneath the microscope, upload a 30-second video into an app that has an algorithm that automatically calculates the concentration of red tide based on its shape, size, and movement. That information automatically goes to a NOAA respiratory irritation model so that we have real-time respiratory irritation results. Next, this is kind of my baby, and Vince and I uh, developed this. This is called CSIC, Citizen Science Information. It, it, we just wanted to make CSIC work. Um, <laughs> but so this is so to fill in those gaps between beaches, uh, not only to, for data collection, but also to empower the public, put the reporting in their hands. Um, we developed this citizen science reporting app. And me, and, and I'll talk about that, am I talking about that next? Yes, I am. So for me, I, uh, I'm gonna go through my background a little bit. I'm a stormwater engineer. Uh, my expertise is in design, uh, developing stormwater treatment technology, uh, hydrologic restoration on a water scale level. That is what my PhD is in. So um, I want, it was really important to me to have inland effects of cyanobacteria blooms, any kind of odors, wildlife fatalities, ecosystem changes. So red tide, we know that, that it happens uh, as NOAA has maps for it every single year since 1986, I think except for one, and likely it's just because they didn't, they didn't sample in the location where the bloom was. Um, we know that it's not caused by human activities, but if a bloom is close enough to shore to use surface water nutrients, it's very possible that that bloom can be maintained, sustained, or even increase in, in, in intensity. Uh, to, what, to what level, we just don't know yet. The data is not there. Um, and there is no direct correlation with a lot of these things. However, just intuitively, we know that, that it's a phytoplankton. It can use nutrients. Now, now, red tide can use, as they said, like 12 different forms of nutrients. It doesn't need that surface water nutrients, but can it use it? Of course. Um, so what can we do if, if we can do anything to, to try to help that, that duration or intensity of an existing bloom. And um, have you guys ever seen somebody throw garbage out of their car window before? Have you ever asked them where they think it goes? Well, <laughs> the reason why I took this job is because it, it included communication. So I started seeing my friends throw garbage out their car window and it turned out in a formal survey that 72% of the people that I asked in the state of Florida didn't know where their stormwater went or thought that it went to a wastewater treatment plant. 
Every single drop of rain that falls in the state of Florida goes to a natural water body. Um, and I realized that, that with that information, people started changing behavior. Um, and that's why education is so important. Um, the most powerful slide that I've ever shown in my, in my presentations is this one right here, um, showing how the natural hydrology um, and the fraction of water on the surface and the groundwater, how it used to be. And then when we urbanize, we build, we, we cover the surface of the land with, with something called impervious surface, which is concrete or asphalt, something that water can't penetrate. Um, and with that, not only are we changing the hydrologic cycle, but we're changing uh, the fraction of water so the water is flowing off the surface at higher velocities, higher volumes, lower water quality, um, and it's causing erosion, uh, water quality issues, and of course, freshwater cyanobacteria blooms that we know are a direct effect of, of nutrient runoff. So this is, um, if you guys are gators, that's the Lake Alice watershed, and that's what I did my restoration plan on. And they had high nutrient loading. They were adding copper sulfate to kill freshwater cyanobacteria blooms, and then they were deep well injecting any overflow. And my, just side note, my, uh, my results of my dissertation um, allowed for no flooding at all, um, no use of copper sulfate, and, uh, and no injection um, to the Florida aquifer because we were uh, encouraging that infiltration throughout the watershed um, to mimic natural hydrology. So low impact development is basically just trying to take an urban environment and mimic the natural hydrology um, by in encouraging that infiltration and recharge the groundwater table, um, cleaning that water before it goes to our natural water bodies. And so these are just some examples of low impact development techniques. Now, implementing these at a watershed, a coastal watershed, will they eliminate the occurrence of red tide? Of course not. Red tide would happen whether we were here or not. However, if a bloom is close enough to shore and we have any control over the intensity or duration, it's kind of like climate change. If we have some control, then why wouldn't we you know, make those changes? So back to red tide. Um, when it comes to shellfish, fish, we get a lot of these questions, and, and Rich actually developed this slide. Um, so if you have any questions about about the toxins or whether you can eat shellfish, you know, don't go, don't go fishing in the middle of red tide. Don't eat dead fish; it's not a good idea. And don't let your dogs um, lick dead fish or the sea foam if there is a red tide bloom, because the toxin can ac accumulate um, on that those sea foam bubbles, just like Rich was talking about with the aerosolization. Um, and here are some red tide resources that I'm going to leave up for you guys to, to look at. All right, thanks. Another housekeeping note, this is being streamed live and also it'll be up on our website. Uh, Rhonda Watkins, uh, Collier County, talk about uh, the role of Collier County and, and what we're doing currently. Hi, thank you so much for coming out to hear this uh, presentation. Hopefully you're getting some good information to take home with you. Just wanna to talk to you about what Collier County does to monitor and mitigate red tide in Collier County. That's maybe. Okay, so Collier County has five uh, sampling sites. We've actually been sampling uh, since 1995 uh, when we had that large bloom that uh, I think Vince mentioned. Um, but what we realized was we were only sampling when red tide was out there. So we had 100% incidence of red tide in our samples because that's when we were collecting our samples. So I set up a fixed station uh, at five sites in Collier County so we could get samples every week. Uh, DOH currently helps us with that sampling as part of their healthy beaches monitoring. They also collect red tide samples for us. Um, and then Rookery Bay uh, volunteers actually do some monitoring in the passes in Marco Island. 
Um, but they're volunteers, so they're not always available. Um, and we found in the summer months this year, uh, while we've had this red tide all summer, they don't have the volunteers to actually go out and get samples in those passes. So we've got limited information down there. Um, the offshore transects that we get uh, typically are done by MOAT or FWC because um, we don't have the boats to go out and, and get samples and they do uh, routine cruises out there. So how do you find out what the red tide situation is like in, red, in Collier County? So we have the red tide hotline um, that was implemented back in the early 2000s and I think it was one of the first red tide hotlines in the state. Uh, FWC didn't even have one at the time. Uh, in 2018, we've gotten over 19,000 calls to that hotline. So what will you find out when you call the hotline? You're gonna get the most recent red tide results from the sampling at those five beach locations. Uh, you'll also get what's happened since the last update. So if we've gotten reports of respiratory irritation or dead fish, that information will be on the hotline. Uh, the unfortunate thing about the samples that we take is that it can sometimes take up to 48 hours to get results. We do not analyze those in-house. They go to St. Petersburg to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Um, and they are getting slammed with the number of samples that they're getting this season. So they're not always getting a sample re results back in 24 hours. It's sometimes taking 48 hours. Uh, unfortunately, the, the conditions of red tide can change uh, from day to day. So we could take a sample on Monday uh, and may have dead fish on Monday, and then by Wednesday, the winds have shifted, dead fish are gone, there's no respiratory irritation. So we, the, the reason we take those samples is so we can get of a base of knowledge. Um, it's also used by NOAA in their forecasting uh, so we get a good idea of what's really happening. The Red Tide e-notice, it's just an email blast, has the same information as the Red Tide hotline. Uh, we've had in the last 90 days over 178,000 visits to our Red Tide update page. Same, same information, it's just different ways to get it. Uh, the beach conditions reporting system that Tracy mentioned, uh, we have four beaches in Collier County, that's probably your best way to get the information because that is the most real-time information we have. That will tell you on any given day whether there's respiratory irritation or dead fish at those four beaches. Um, you can also look at the we National Weather Service uh, bulletin if you guys have apps on your phone and you get a beach hazard statement at the top of that when you go to the home page. It's typically because there's red tide um, associated impacts in that location. Um, the other thing that we have is we have signs on our beaches. Uh, these are the signs. So when there's no red tide at the beach, you'll see a pretty shell sign letting you know what kind of things you're going to find. If there is red tide, you will see this sign deployed at the beach letting you know that red tide is present. Those signs are deployed when there's red tide anywhere in Collier County because we can't predict from day to day where red tide's going to be. So we make sure all those signs are flipped countywide. If red tide was reported in Barefoot Beach in North Naples, that South Margo Beach sign is flipped. Uh, dead fish. Uh, we do rake our, the county beaches daily. We rake um, actually during a routine event when there's not a lot of dead fish. We do it on the weekdays and not necessarily on the weekends. The Vanderbilt Beach is raked from the Ritz-Carlton to Del Norwegian State Park, and Marco Island is actually raked from Tiger Tail Beach to South Marco Beach. It takes more than a day to get all of Marco done because it's such a large beach. Uh, but when conditions like we've had this year uh, warrant it, we'll also just rake every day, including the weekends, um, and we do from Barefoot Beach, or excuse me, Bonita Beach Road to Barefoot Beach, and also the Clam Pass beaches. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff we do in, in Collier County just to monitor and get that information out to you. Uh, I do use resources like NOAA satellite imagery to forecast as far as I can to make sure that people have the information if you're sensitive to red tide, whether or not the winds are going to be in the, in the direction that you may feel it. Um, but you can go to the beach if red tide is present and the wind's blowing in the right direction and you would never know it's there. So please check out those resources um, if you haven't already. Uh, we do have some brochures in the back and red hotline magnets, so you won't ever forget the number. So thank you. Another housekeeping information. As you leave, there's a table 
on your right, and Senator Pasadomo has uh, literature there about red tide. We welcome you to take it home. Thank you very much, Senator Pasadomo. We, our office also has a sign-in sheet. Uh, if you leave your email, then you'll get information from us about everything in Collier County. So we'd appreciate if you'd like to, just sign it and pick, certainly pick up this information as you leave. And our next speaker is uh, Phil Wood of the South Florida Water Management District. Thank you, that's Phil Flood. How can you forget that with a water management district? Come on. <laughs> uh, well, I was asked if I could come over here and give just kind of a cursory overview of, about watersheds, uh, what is a watershed, and talk about a little bit about some of them, and then, and then a little bit about one of our regulatory programs that deals with the management of surface water uh, here in the state of Florida. So. So first of all, just kind of what is a watershed? Well, simply stated, it's, it's just an area of land that water flows across to get to a common, a, a common water body. So it could be a canal, it could be a stream, it might be a lake, uh, or even, even an estuary. Uh, this right here is a graphic of the Lake Okeechobee watershed, and, and you can see it's kind of broken up. It has a bunch of sub-basins to it, and those are various tributaries that flow directly into uh, the, the Kissimmee River or into uh, Lake Okeechobee. You'll see that it covers not only the south and the east and the west, but also goes to the north. And in this particular watershed, it it's, it's, it's primarily stretches up to the north to capture the Kissimmee, uh, Kissimmee River and the chain of lakes up there. And I just wanted to point out that 95% of the water that comes into Lake Okeechobee drains in from the north. It doesn't come from the, from the south or the east or the west. The prim primarily, uh, most of it, along with the nutrients that, that, uh, that impair Lake Okeechobee, come, come from the north as well. Uh, over here on the west coast, one of our larger watersheds is, uh, is the Caloosahatchee. Uh, it's, it's pretty extensive. It's about 70 miles. It stretches from Lake Okeechobee over to San Carlos Bay. It drains parts of, parts of four counties. Uh, it was uh, artificially connected to Lake Okeechobee, and as a result of that, it now gets part of its water that flows into the estuary uh, comes from Lake Okeechobee. Back in the 1880s, they, they dredged to connect the, the Caloosahatchee to Lake Okeechobee. And here, also, I wanted to kind of point out that um, here over the last five years, um, less than 40% of the water that flows down the Caloosahatchee into the estuary comes from Lake Okeechobee. And that water is, this, that's discharge water that, that we're talking about. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the water comes from within that watershed, what drains from those, those four counties. And along with that, 61% uh, of the nitrogen, which is what the estuary is impaired for, comes from the watershed outside of Lake Okeechobee. So that's just basin runoff and nutrients that's coming in from the four counties that, that drain into the Caloosahatchee. So. In Collier County, you've got a pretty large watershed here as, as well, um, but I wanted to point out that it is not connected to Lake, either Lake Okeechobee or the Caloosahatchee watershed. Um, it's, it, uh, much of it drains into the, uh, the canal system that's managed as part of the Big Cypress, Big Cypress Basin. So. So let me switch gears a little bit and, and just touch base about surface water management. Um, if a city or county or a developer or an individual wishes to come and do some type of a development, be it a residential development, a, a new road, a school, a commercial development, they're gonna have to get a, a permit to deal with the surface water management uh, of, the, of that property. And it's a statewide environmental resource permit. Uh, those permits are issued by the state of Florida or by the Department <laughs> of Environmental Protection or else the water management districts. And the, the entire purpose here is to, is to try to properly manage our, our wetlands and, and the water flow. So if somebody is interested in, in um, constructing a reservoir or a dam, uh, do dredge and fill work, uh, con con construct some canals, install some type of conveyance with culverts, they're gonna come to the state of Florida and get, get a permit to, to make sure that it's done properly and it's not gonna adversely affect the environment. Um, there's some pretty extensive um, review criteria that goes involved with the permitting. Uh, it's all laid out in statute and in, and in rule. And, and its, uh, its focus is, is on uh, protecting the wetlands, uh, also water quality, and, and water quantity. So I'm not gonna go into great detail uh, about those, but, um, uh, but it, here in Collier County, the county has adopted a, an allowable discharge rate, which uh, essentially uh, identifies how much water a given watershed or a creek or tributary um, can accommodate. 
And based upon the, those, uh, that allowable discharge rate that was, uh, that was adopted by the county, when the water management district issues a permit, we're going to make sure that any development uh, is not going to adversely affect the, that watershed. We're going to make sure that you're not going to be uh, draining too much water off the land or the, or the water that, that rains onto there is not going to adversely affect. It's not going to overwhelm that. If they, they try, to request, uh, try to discharge more water than what's allowable, the, the permit will be denied. So. Uh, the, the types of permits that, that we get involved in, the water management districts, we do uh, residential developments, uh, docks and marinas that are associated with, with residential developments, agriculture, commercial uh, developments, highways. Uh, the Department of Environmental Protection, they issue uh, similar uh, environmental resource permits. Uh, and, and those are, they issue, they get involved on mining uh, activities, industrial developments, uh, landfills, commercial marinas, and they also get involved in single families. Just uh, real simply, um, every one of these developments is, or permit is going to be required to have a surface water management system to, to make sure that we're not adversely affecting the, uh, the, the wetlands or, or overdraining the area or sending too much water. Uh, it essentially, the purpose is to prevent flooding of habitable structures and to treat that stormwater before it ultimately gets discharged into that, that drainage basin, into that, that water body. So quite simply, you know, rain falls on, on the surface and then largely will get collected in, in swales. From there, it's going to be con carried or conveyed into, uh, into lakes or detention areas where, where it's stored and there'll be some water quality treatment associated. And, and it stays there until, until it is ultimately discharged via a wear or some type of water control structure that sends the water then onto the receiving body. So, so kind of that's the, that's the simple, uh, simple nuts and bolts of, uh, of how we issue our permits and the purposes of those. So, and, and I'm sure we'll answer some questions a little bit later. So. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds. Good evening. Uh, first, I just want to thank all of you for coming out. This is a huge investment of your time to come out tonight. I know the weather is not great for everybody to be driving in, um, but on behalf of all of us up here, we appreciate your interest and your commitment to doing what we can to address these problems. And I can assure you that all of the agencies and the elected officials that have put on this venue tonight are committed to working with each and every one of you to do what we each can in order to educate, but more importantly, find solutions that help us all deal with these challenging times. So Dr. Fanara talked a little bit about what happens when water falls on the landscape. Well, a good portion of it goes into Lake Okeechobee. And then I have to find something to do with it. And water moves into Lake Okeechobee at about three to six times what I can deliver out of Lake Okeechobee with the current infrastructure. So right now we're looking at rainfall coming in this weekend and it's looking like it's going to be pretty substantial. So we don't have a hurricane coming down on us, but it looks like we do have a tropical depression that's going to bring maybe six to eight inches of rain across Florida. This spaghetti chart doesn't really start on January 1st because what I want you to take a look at is that blue mountain that's on the far right side of the slide. That was the impact to Lake Okeechobee from Hurricane Irma. And what did Hurricane Irma do across Florida? It brought a lot of rain, it brought a lot of wind, it brought a lot of damage. We had septic failures that put a lot of wastewater into not just the Gulf, but into many of our canals. We had extensive water sitting on the landscape that eventually drained into canals, but brought with it decades of nutrients that had been sitting on previous agricultural fields that drained into our canals. And that's what's in some of the water that we're moving across still today, trying to get rid of out of um, our landscape and into not just our estuaries, but into the bays all around our state. 
So then you can see where we are today, and I know this is a spaghetti chart and difficult to understand, but where that pink box or pink bubble is, that's where Lake Okeechobee stands today, so at about 14 and a half feet above sea level. You can see just to the right of that, many of those lines have a drastic increase. That's because traditionally in September and October, we see a lot of rain in Florida. That means I see the lake rise between one and three feet almost every year. That rise is still to come. So I'm telling you that because I'm trying to manage expectations. We're gonna have to continue to discharge water out of Lake Okeechobee. Because if that water stays in the lake, we have a problem with potential flooding, direct flooding to over 137,000 people that live and work around Lake Okeechobee. So what are we doing about that? We're fixing the Herbert Hoover Dyke so that it can withstand those one to three foot quick rises in the lake without putting too much pressure on the dike. And in cooperation with all of you, with your elected officials, with the House of Representatives, with the state senators, the state legislature, the governor, our senators in Washington, and the administration, they have fully funded the work on the Herbert Hoover Dyke. And I'm telling you that not because this is the one thing that can solve all of our problems, because it can't. And even after the Herbert Hoover Dyke is fixed, with the other current infrastructure that we have, there will still be discharges from the estuaries. And in the future, even after all of SERP is completed, there may still be discharges to the estuaries, but they will be far less frequently. And there'll be times when we have major storm events. Not every year. So the Herbert Hoover Dyke is important because it's a major piece of the puzzle. It protects our citizens in South Florida from flooding and it proves that when we work together and we have major projects that are fully funded, we can expedite them and we can get them done. So we are looking at having the Herbert Hoover Dyke completed in 2022 not 2025, like we were telling you last year, but 2022, and that will be the first major puzzle piece to this system that brings us to solutions for tomorrow. Our next speaker is uh, Jennifer Leeds. Good evening. Uh, I'm Jennifer Leeds. Uh, I'm with the South Florida Water Management District. I'm a section administrator there. Um, I'm in the Everglades Policy and uh, Coordination Division. And uh, some of the solutions that Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds just talked about, I'm going to talk about five of those uh, that both the Water Management District is doing in conjunction with our partner, the Corps of Engineers, in a program that we call the uh, Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, we currently have about 18 of these projects that are either being planned, designed, or under construction. However, I'm only going to focus on five of those, and the reason why I'm going to do that is those five are going to provide some major storage that is much needed in the system, both north, south, east, and west of the lake. Uh, just to kind of orient uh, everyone where we're, what we're kind of looking at, um, the take-home message I have is the the map, okay, sorry. The map that is on the right, uh, the area that you see that is in white, that is the 16 counties that make up the water management district. The areas that are circled in black are the five uh, projects that I want to talk to you about. Uh, but first, I want to just orient everyone how water flows throughout the system. Uh, if you look in the center of the map, uh, we have Lake Okeechobee. Um, and water comes down from the Kissimmee River from the north, it flows into the lake. Depending on lake conditions, which Lieutenant Colonel Renham was just talking about, we have the ability to either flow water to the St. Lucie uh, River if we need to, to the east. It can go to the Caloosahatchee River uh, to the west. Um, but primarily the water will flow south from Lake Okeechobee 
in several major canals that we have. And as it flows south, it goes through an area we call the Everglades Agricultural Area. But before that water flows into the Everglades itself, um, it goes into what we call our stormwater treatment areas. Uh, and these areas are constructed wetlands, and they are designed to pull nutrients out of the water. And they were specifically designed to meet certain uh, state water quality standards before they actually go and flow into the Everglades uh, and then continue to flow south through Everglades National Park and ultimately out to uh, Florida Bay and into Biscayne Bay. So these are the five projects I want to talk about. Um, C-43, uh, which is over here on the west coast on, on the Caloosahatchee. Uh, C-44 Reservoir, which is being built on the St. Lucie River. Um, we also have uh, some planning projects that are put, looking to put storage north of the lake uh, in the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. Um, and then I'm going to finish up by talking a little bit about the Central Everglades Planning Project. So with the uh, Caloosahatchee River, the West Basin Storage Reservoir, uh, this was designed to primarily capture both basin runoff and Lake Okeechobee releases. Uh, it's a very large storage feature. It's over 10,000 acres in size, and it can hold uh, about 170,000 acre feet worth of water. Uh, it was also designed to hold some water in the reservoir through the dry season to be able to provide some of the additional fresh water flows during the dry season into the Caloosahatchee to help improve some of the uh, salinity levels in the estuary. Uh, this is one of our uh, reservoirs that's currently under construction. Um, it has a minor, a small pump station that was just finished, um, and they're working on finishing the, uh, the design of the embankment, um, and they should start construction on that very soon. Um, so this, this feature is situated along the Caloosahatchee River, um, and it will pull water in through the town, can, Townsend Canal, hold it, release it as it needs, um, and so it will go up and down and fluctuate um, as, it's, as it's designed. Another major uh, project that is currently under construction uh, is on the St. Lucie River. Uh, it's uh, along the C-44 canal. Um, it too is uh, designed to hold both local basin runoff and releases from Lake Okeechobee. Um, construction on this feature was started in October of 2014. Um, it also has a, a stormwater treatment area along with the reservoir to help uh, treat the water before it is released um, out of the reservoir and down into the St. Lucie estuary. Um, and we're looking to have this project completed, um, both the STA and the reservoir um, in December of 2000, uh, 2020. Uh, the STA will be finished in about uh, spring of 2019 and the reservoir will follow it. Next, uh, we talked about storage um, on to the east of the lake, and we've also looked at some storage that's to the west of the lake. Both of those are currently under construction. Uh, one of our planning projects that we are undertaking right now is looking at placing a storage feature north of the lake. Um, this is designed to take in flows coming off the Kissimmee River prior to it going into Lake Okeechobee. Uh, this has both um, shallow above ground storage, and it also has um, a storage feature called aquifer storage and recovery wells. These wells are designed to store water below ground in an aquifer uh, over long periods of time, and then um, after an event passes or when it's needed, we can bring the water up out of the wells um, and put them back into the storage features and then deliver it south. Uh, there's also some wetland restoration that is going on with this project. Um, we're looking to restore um, about 6,000 acres worth of uh, wetlands along the Kissimmee River. Uh, this storage feature provides benefits to both of the estuaries. In addition, it will help with uh, water supply. <coughs> so everyone talks about being able to need um, additional storage within the system, and then they want to be able to send the water south. So to be able to send the water south, we need to be able to what we call open up the central part of the system by backfilling some canals and putting in some additional infrastructure. That is what the Central Everglades Planning Project is designed to do. It was authorized uh, by Congress in 2016. Um, the money, uh, the funding is, is currently being appropriated. There are several components that have been accelerated by the Water Management District 
um, some features, uh, things like removing old Tamiami Trail that will help to um, uh, allow that water to flow south from uh, the middle of the water conservation areas in the Everglades into Everglades National Park. Um, it also has a storage feature, which is highlighted by the circle in the middle um, on a component there we call it the A2 component. Um, it had a shallow storage feature, um, but the one thing I'd like to point out with that is while that did provide storage, uh, the Water Management District over the past year undertook a study to look at that and see how we can make that a deep storage area instead of shallow to hold some of that additional water. And, um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, it's also referred to as the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir. Um, and it is also de so it is designed to hold uh, deeper storage south of the lake. It also has an STA component on it. Um, it will provide benefits to both estuaries by reducing some of those damaging discharges. Um, and it also provides additional water um, to the Everglades itself. Currently, uh, this feasibility study is um, in Congress um, and is waiting to be taken up under the Water Resources Development Act. So I wanted to talk about those five uh, projects because they're the ones that will have um, a direct effect and benefit on the estuaries by providing that additional storage needed in the system um, to reduce some of those uh, damaging discharges that we see. And the last thing I want to just kind of um, highlight are there are some uh, both short-term and long-term restoration projects uh, that both uh, the Water Management District and the Corps of Engineers are undertaking um, that are the key to solving some of these estuary discharge problems. In the short term, we have things like dispersed water management projects. These are public-private partnerships that the district is undertaking uh, to be able to temporarily store water um, on agricultural fields. Uh, you may have heard of something called an estuary protection well. These are deep well injection um, to be able to take some of these high excessive flows, be able to put the water underground. Um, temporary deviations, um, and we've mentioned uh, the C43 and the C44 reservoir. Long term, we're looking to complete our planning projects, both uh, the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, um, getting the EAA reservoir um, authorized and starting design on that. Um, also on the east side, we're looking at uh, starting some uh, additional design work um, in the, uh, on the St. Lucie Estuary side. Um, and also north of the lake, we have what we called our Northern Everglades and Estuary Protection Program, um, which looks at uh, water attenuation and treatment projects north of the lake to help that watershed to, to be able to improve the water and clean it up before it actually gets into Lake Okeechobee. Um, so with that, that concludes uh, some of the projects I wanted to highlight. Our next speaker, we're going to try to patch in through Skype, so we'll we'll watch our technology work. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bill Mitch, are you there? I am. I am here, uh, and I don't know if my slideshow is, but hopefully it is. I, I believe we can see your slide presentation, at least the first one, possibly. Well, I think that's about the twentieth one. They don't need to see me. Right. Here we okay, go. but I believe you're there. I'm here. Is, is my slide there now? Yes, sir. All right. And I can move it along. All right. So you have 10 minutes, sir. Yeah. Well, this is going to go fast. Uh, All right. Again, thank you so much for inviting me to this event. I wish I was down there in person. Uh, my lab is in Naples. I feel strongly about uh, protecting the environment down there. And uh, hopefully we can make a little impact. Um, this is my outline. Uh, I'm going to be talking about harmful algal blooms just briefly because that's been covered. I'm going to tie into the Everglades restoration, sort of similar to what Jennifer just did, Lake Okeechobee, water quality and so on. It's all one big story and I think the public has a lot of trouble connecting the dots so I'll try to do that. Then the recent red tide investigations that we did in Fort Myers area and then talk a little bit about isotope analysis that we're going to do. We, we have not got the samples analyzed yet. And then what it's going to do to take to fix all of this. I guess that's where I'm going to end up and then some conclusions. First of all, there's nothing new about harmful algal blooms, but what is new is the, uh, 
the intensity of these harmful wounds and how many there are, and, and there's lots of speculation that it's climate change that's driving it because that's a temperature phenomenon, and phytoplankton growing in water is very much temperature controlled. Uh, the other criteria is that we just flat out plastered our landscape with nutrients. I think that's one of the most driving points of all this. All these green waters and red waters and brown waters, uh, a lot has to do with the fact that we just don't have any room for all the fertilizer we've been putting on the landscape for the last hundred years. So, so this suggests that there's sort of 750 aquatic ecosystems worldwide suffering. I think it's probably more like 7,500, but this is from the World Resource Institute. And they're called harmful algal blooms, they're called uh, hypoxia, uh, there are lots of different terms. Okay, going straight to the Everglades story, because we're gonna back into this uh, after I talk about our uh, study on red tide. On the left shows the very typical graphic that always been around of what the Everglades used to be. It was a north-south flowing system. Water came down the Kissimmee River, it filled the lake. The lake seasonally spilled over its banks. On the south side, there was no Hoover Dam there, and there was a slow flowing, uh, almost river-like system, but not with very much velocity at all, going through um, what Marjorie uh, Stone Douglas called a river of grass, and actually it's not a river of grass, it's a river of sedges, but that's not very poetic. So uh, it's north-south system, so absolutely anything to restore the Everglades, you wanna return to that north-south corridor. The, the middle graph shows the current situation, you heard about that, and, and those big arrows going east and west to our ocean and to our gulf are big arrows for a reason. There's a lot of water now going east and west out of the lake instead of south. And then the right side shows what the restoration plan, and by the way, this graphic was from the 1990s, and I deliberately didn't show anything going east and west because that was the original plan, that it was all supposed to go down south into the Everglades, replenish the Everglades, uh, slow down fires, uh, get fresh water down uh, to the Florida, uh, down into uh, Florida Bay and so on. And so that still remains the goal of the Everglades restoration in my view is to send the water south. But you can see in this middle picture what's going on with the excessive water that we now have for all sorts of reasons that you've heard it in previous surfaces, agricultural runoff and so on. We just have much more water going through this system than even nature ever had. And to whether we're gonna to get to this point where all the water flows south, it remains to be seen. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that have been happening recently. I'm going to share with you the 2016 uh, pollution uh, that came down from the uh, Lake Okeechobee to southwest Florida because it was so vivid and most importantly uh, it caught a lot of attention because it happened when snowbirds were down here. It happened in January and February 2016. Usually these events are happening like they are now in the summer when everybody's up north. But boy this caught the attention of a lot of people. And what you see there is that's not a parking lot, that is the actual color of the flowing uh, water coming out of Lake Okeechobee, uh, superimposed or next to a, a bluish uh, Gulf of Mexico. There was an unseasonable amount of precipitation that fell in South Florida in the dry season of January 2016 due to extensive frontal storms that came through supposedly caused by El Nino. Approximately 3.1 billion cubic meters of polluted o Lake Okeechobee water was sent down the Caloosahatchee to the Gulf and the St. Lucie Canal to the Atlantic in 2016. I mean, that's just a gigantic amount of water, severely polluting both estuaries. The pumping of the water to these outlets was deemed necessary. Of course, you've heard about this, but uh, because of high and unsafe Lake Okeechobee water levels, which were in turn due to high rainfall events. Five months later, Four or five months later, the Florida governor declared a state of emergency for both coastlines over guacamole thick blue green algal blooms in the coastal waters. I still don't to this day eat guacamole anymore because of that term that was used in 2016. Uh, so it was a real mess then. And then here's a political cartoon that I thought was cute. I hope this doesn't offend anybody. Look, George, you can see the corrupt and immoral environmental policies from here. And uh, George got.
Because really, we do have to have the gumption to solve these problems, and, and I don't know that the political will is there yet. So that takes us to August uh, 2018, red tide in southwest Florida. Uh, we were doing a study anyhow on Lake Okeechobee, so it was not very hard for us to say, well, let's extend this uh, Lake Okeechobee study into, uh, into the Gulf waters and see if there's a connection. So that's why uh, we ended up doing a study. We announced it to my university. My university told CNN, and CNN got all excited and jumped on the boat with us. Uh, and that's why this ended up in a big national news story. Um, red side sampling, we, we did on, you know, August 8th and 9th, we were out on the, the Gulf. Uh, now, I'm mostly a wetland guy, and I hang out in water that's about two to three feet deep at most. So I'm out in the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico, serious sampling. This shows what the red tide actually looks like. It's a, a brownish color sometimes. Uh, and once again, August 2018, just as in August of 2016, the Florida governor declared a state of emergency for Florida, but this time for two distinct harmful algal blooms, the blue-green freshwater harmful algal blooms and the red tide saltwater harmful algal blooms. And I can see why the public gets confused. What's going on? Uh, you need a scorecard almost for both of these. Uh, our sampling was very simple. We, we're not nearly doing what uh, Moat Marine or other organizations are doing, of exhaustive sampling. We just simply went out on two days and it took about uh, 15 hours total uh, and sampled at, five, at uh, nine different locations that you can see here. Eight of them were saltwater systems and, and one was up the Caloosahatchee where it was fresh water. And um, I'm sharing, you're the first people, even my graduate students haven't seen this, the first people to see these data. Uh, and it's very preliminary. It's about 10% of the numbers we're eventually going to get. So I just want to walk you through this. Again, on the left, you can see the, the sampling station la label. You can see where we sa sampled. Most of you know where the Sanibel Causeway is, where Punta Rasa is, uh, and of course where Fort Mowage Beach is. And that's the location. We started 20 miles off of the coastline and worked our way in over those two days. I'll call your attention to the data on the right here immediately. Uh, we do have some nitrate concentrations. Now, nitrate is an inorganic form of nitrogen. Uh, if you had to pick one chemical that's going to probably accelerate red tide, not cause, necessarily cause it, but accelerate it, I would bet on nitrate. Um, and, and I wrote these in micrograms per liter. That's basically parts per billion, if you want. And you can see in the next column, the the uh, counts of the red algae, and these are big numbers, but the first numbers, uh, there was just none. There was zero when we were 20 miles out, and then we started to see medium concentrations, then high, then low, and the nitrate nitrogen in parts per billion is not very high at all. It was 11. So I want to compare that. Then we went up the river just to see what the Caloosahatchee was when it was fresh water, and it was 228. So there you have the contrast between ocean water, typical ocean water nitrate, and what you get in the Caloosahatchee. It's uh, certainly two or at least one order, if not more, uh, higher in the uh, freshwater system. Then uh, we went the next day, and we stayed pretty much close to the beaches, uh, starting at the Sanibel Causeway. And you can see this time we got a little bit more nitrates in some of the samples and the numbers are just totally off the chart they're in, you know these are cells of red red algae per liter and the numbers are extraordinarily high and of course that's we were having problems in uh then at fort myers beach and it's not surprising because those were very serious uh, red algae blooms so that's sort of our one two-day shot that we did and then just to make it more interesting, uh, I told my student, well, you better get some rainfall. And they said, what are you doing that for? I said, just, just do it. And, and, and uh, the student put out a sampler. They made sure that it was absolutely acid washed and took all the precautions you do for cat collection precipitation and got 167 micrograms nitrogen per liter for nitrates from rainfall. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I haven't heard anybody talk about rainfall as a possible cause or accelerator of red tide, and I think it has to be on the table, especially because this comes from your automobile. So folks, if we're going to start regulating for red tide, we have to start looking at whether we're going to start to have some public transportation along the east-western corridor, because that may be one of the causes. I'm not saying it is. That's what our study might be able to pin down. So that's a lot of data. This shows that graphically where the low, not present, medium, and high concentrations are on a map that shows Sanibel Island and Caloosahatchee. We're also going to be doing, and we don't have any results on this yet because we have to send the samples off to the University of California, isotopic analysis of Lake Okeechobee and Gulf. Um, nitrate, as we talked about, NO3, um, is made up of nitrogen and oxygen. And nitrogen's usual uh, weight is, is 14, but there are isotopes that are 15, very, very small percentage of the nitrogen. And likewise, the NO3, the oxygen is usually 16, but there's oxygen 18 as well in the environment, very tiny percentage. And what we do, and this graphic sort of illustrates it, is that you can take the two isotopes, and there's a special lab, very few labs that can do this analysis. We all, everybody in the country seems to send their samples to, to uh, University of California Davis Laboratory. And they will give you the two numbers, uh, for example, on nitrates. And if you match them up, the, the uh, isotope for oxygen, the isotope for nitrogen, you can sort of see what box you fall in. And if you fall in this box, it suggests that nitrogen, the nitrate that you take the sample of, came from the atmosphere. If, however, if you fall in these boxes, uh, it suggests that nitrate came from fertilizer. And then there's ammonium fertilizers, and so on and so forth. So what it does, it gives you some idea of where the uh, water comes from. It's sort of a, a detective uh, tool that's been developed in the last few years in ecology to determine cause and effect in water resources, especially something that deals with nitrogen. And we do think nitrogen is a major player in this. Uh, we ha had, by the way, a student, or I should say a Doc, a professor, Pei Ma, PhD, a visiting scientist from uh, China uh, in our lab, and her specialty was isotopic analysis. So then I suggested, this was months ago, that she start looking at Lake Okeechobee, and she's done that. So really, I have to give credit to, to Professor Pei Ma for a visiting scientist. She, she's not from Florida. She came because of our lab, and it really pays off when we have international people come uh, to Florida to help us out. So we have some data on that, and so we already had that study started, so now we're going to see if it matches what we're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico from that study I just explained. So we don't have any results to give you on that. Everybody calling me every day, Bill, did you get the analysis yet? I don't have it, <laughs> and I won't have it for several months. But what's the big picture, the solution to all these HABs in South Florida? It, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's right in front of us and we don't even know it. Um, the, I understand and I heard the report uh, uh, from Jennifer about the new Ag Everglades Agriculture Area Reservoir proposal. I think it was part, part of the CEPP. And it's shown there in graphics below uh, Lake Okeechobee and the flow south to the Everglades from Lake Okeechobee will increase by 76% as a result of this reservoir that's being built, from 210 to 370 acre feet per year. The main feature of this EAA reservoir is a reservoir. It's 240,000 acre foot reservoir, 23 feet deep, and about 100,000 or 10,000 acres in area. And that's built primarily for water storage. Only 6,500 acres of treatment wetlands, they're referred to by the district as STAs, I prefer to call them wetlands, only a 13% is proposed in this system. I realize they say other systems are going to be borrowed, but basically for new wetlands they're talking about a 13% increase, despite the fact that there's a 76% increase in flow. As designed, this is 
Professor Mitch talking only. This EAA reservoir project will likely deliver phosphorus contaminated water to the Florida Everglades. And that is the dilemma we are in, ladies and gentlemen. We just have, we're close, but we're not solving this problem at all if the water is polluted as it goes in the Everglades. In fact, it will go in the Everglades and it won't come out the other end, but it will contaminate the Everglades forever. So, now having said that, I have, I have consistently in the literature praised uh, the South Florida Water Management District and others who came up with these SDAs or wetlands or what, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and they've built 57,000 acres of these wetlands have been created and they work. And they should be very proud of them. And I do see press releases all the time. They are very proud of them. We just need a few more. This is what they look like. It looks like a wetland to you, right? Uh, anyhow, and they're very effective. This is from a 2016 report for the district that suggested, and I'll summarize all the data for you, for all of them combined in 2015, the inflow phosphorus was 99 parts per billion, which is much better than it used to be, and the outflow 17 parts per billion. By any standard, they should receive gigantic award for this, that these are working so well. Yes, there's a, a consistent issue that the federal government and some other organizations would like to see it down to 10 parts per million, but to get down to 17, 16, uh, even 20, is really a really significant accomplishment. That water is pretty darn clean. Um, so let's keep 10 as our target, but uh, and maybe someday we'll hit it. So I'm going to summarize with conclusions here. Red tide and is has been a natural phenomenon, uh, not and then uh, human activities, principally high fertilizer agriculture, bear some of the responsibility for giving natural red tide a booster shot. The how much that is, we don't know. Which eight, which uh, farming practices and so on, we don't know. But there is absolutely no question that with the amount of uh, fertilizer we put on our landscape, uh, some of it is due to agricultural activity. Wetlands can be designed to remove significant amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus from agriculture and stormwater runoff, and are significant sinks of atmospheric carbon as well to mitigate climate change, by the way. They take carbon out of the air atmosphere too. So that's what I mean. Our answer is right in front of us, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the swamps. They're going to save us if we create and restore them properly and we don't overload them with nutrients. And I refer to these wetlands like the STAs and all sorts of wetlands that are, I call them blue carbon, blue, uh, blue collar wetlands. They're the hardworking wetlands that allow the white collar wetlands, which is the Everglades, to, to be significantly unchanged, but receiving more water. Concentrations on the order of 20 to 30 parts per billion of total phosphorus and one part per million of total nitrogen are reasonable expectations for wetlands, but lower concentrations can be achieved, achieved if, if needed by treatment wetlands in Florida. So that's pretty good water quality if you have the wetlands. Um, in the Florida Everglades, the pollution that's going east and west of our estuaries just has to stop, and the original north to south flow of greater Everglades must be stopped. But this is the dilemma we're still faced with. It has to be clean water. It can't be even slightly dirty because when it goes to the Everglades, it stays in the Everglades for the very reasons that we're building wetlands to clean up the water. The current EAA reservoir plan is inadequate for guaranteed, uh, to get, and it's guaranteed to deliver clean water to the Florida Everglades, in my professional opinion. Florida needs to install 100,000 more acres of treatment wetlands in the 700,000 acre EAA, 14 times more than is currently included in the current EAA reservoir plan, to ensure clean water to the Everglades and subsequent reduction of Lake O discharges to coastal waters. This summarizes more or less a statement that I submitted uh, through the presence of the Everglades uh, to the Army Corps of Engineers when they asked for comments several months ago. 
And then finally, I think just the message I give on every talk I've ever given in the last six uh, years, wetland restoration and creation are not easy. If they were easy, everybody would do it. They require attention to the parents of a good ecosystem, Mother Nature, because Mother Nature's in charge. She will design the plants. If you put a plant in there and Mother Nature says, no, no, I don't want that plant, listen to her. And then the other variable is father time. When you're dealing with creating wetlands to clean up water, these projects take time to reach their potential. So let's pay attention to Mother Nature and father time. Thank you very much. Well, in, in heeding his comments about Mother Nature and Father Time, uh, time is of the essence, so we'll try to get through these questions and answers as we can. Uh, they've been grouped into about four categories, health effects, the lingering nature of red tide. You just heard Dr. Mitch and others talk about nutrient uh, pollution and, and what constitutes that. And then, as he talked about at the end, mitigation strategy. So, uh, one of the questions that I think kind of summarizes a lot of what was being talked about is uh, what can happen at our local level in being able to reduce the nutrient loads uh, that are seem to be affecting uh, the region, as Dr. Mitch talked about, and I'd like to send that to Moat as to what we can do locally. Yeah, he's asking what, what's uh, I'm sending that to you, to, the, to Moat, to Dr. Uh, Fanara, yes, as to what we can do locally to reduce the nutrient load that seems to be affecting both red tide, as you said, as it got closer to the shore, and also on the uh, east coast, which is the green algae blooms. Oh, great question. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, as far as to do a watershed scale retrofit, retrofit plan, it would be super expensive. I would love to be part of that, of course. However, um, people can start doing things right at home, like not fertilizing during the rainy season, um, disconnecting their roof runoff to cisterns and, and letting that water flow out over time. I mean, we can start doing things today. And, and it really does start, start with each of us individually um, trying to lessen that, that impact that we have. Um, so. Uh, hopefully I answered that question. There's another one I think that we can uh, present to the core and also to the South Florida Water Management District. As you're hearing, there's a lot of concern about agriculture and its role as far as being able to put nutrients into Lake Okeechobee and then the concern about the discharge. Um, it was being said that 40% of that water may be coming west. How is it that um, we're trying to monitor or what is it that we can do as far as your thoughts as to how agriculture, you were talking about north side, about being able to clean the water as it's enter Okeechobee. How are those strategies working and, and what is it we can do as citizens to pay attention more closely? Um, okay, I can address that. So speaking to the Everglades agricultural itself, uh, that area is under um, an actual regulatory program um, and they have to meet specific uh, phosphorus concentrations that come off their farms before it heads south um, into the stormwater treatment areas and into the Everglades. Um, and they also pay something called an ag privilege tax. Um, that ag privilege tax money went into the Everglades construction project which constructed the STAs. Uh, but more importantly, the phosphorus concentrations that are coming out of the Everglades agriculture area, they have to meet a 25% reduction, and currently I think they're close to 65% reduction, uh, and they have been for the past several years. Uh, a little bit further over to the west, an area called the C-139 Basin, they're also under a regulatory program. Um, this is mandatory for them. When we talk about north of the lake, um, that is overseen by the Florida Department of Agricultural and Community Services, um, and those uh, farmers and ag areas up there um, have to adhere to something called best management practices. Uh, it's a voluntary program, um, but they can do things to help attenuate some of the water on their land prior to it flowing off. So there are several different levels of uh, regulatory programs and best management practices that are in place throughout the state. 
another question that um, can I jump in real quick? Oh, though, also, in? There, okay. there, there's uh, another program that, that we're involved in it, and it works partnership with some of the uh, the, the agricultural interests up there, and it's a dispersed water management pro program, uh, and, and that's where we partner with them to to divert or store water on on agricultural lands, typically um, uh, pastures, uh, with the idea of keeping that water out of our out of the watershed, keep, keeping that water out of the rivers, out of the Lake Okeechobee. Uh, in those instances, the water that's diverted, anything that has uh, nutrients in it would, would reside, stay right there on the property. Uh, and the idea is to capture, hold that water, let it percolate into the ground, uh, let it evaporate out. So another opportunity where you can partner with some of these agricultural interests to, to get some positive benefits, uh, nutrient reduction and water storage within the watershed. And a lot of that's going on north of the lake and as well as east and west. Another safety question that was asked, and I know, again, uh, doctor, you had this as part of your presentation. Long-term issues with eating fish that are associated with red tide. Uh, one of the questions that's come up, and I saw it as far as the uh, Senate uh, panel yesterday, was being able to have more monitoring stations to be able to act more like weather so that there's an opportunity to alert the public as to when this red tide's occurring. Folks are asking about, you know, why aren't we closing the beaches quicker and notifying folks more quickly. Uh, can you speak to that issue? Yeah, I'm sure that Vince got super excited when you said more monitoring. Oh, more monitoring? Yeah, yeah. that was more dollars. But that was at the federal level, so. No, no, it's, no, not, it's, it's more dollars. data. It's so, more data. Yeah, well, the, um, the analogy to weather is a great analogy. So I think one of the, especially when it comes to red tide, every harmful algal bloom is different. But when it comes to our Florida red tide caused by Carinia brevis, um, probably one of the biggest achievements we can make is to get better at prediction and forecasting. If we know when a bloom is coming, we know where a bloom's going to hit, that can, that can be a large help. Even if we eventually develop a control strategies, knowing when and where to apply those strategies are important as well. And when you, when you make that, uh, that relationship to weather, well, the, the reason we're able to, monitor, to predict and forecast the weather the way we're able to is because of the monitoring that's in place. You know, tons of sensors on land, in the air, in the atmosphere, um, from satellites and also in the water. Um, help us to collect the data that is necessary to know what factors are involved in the weather patterns and then also to measure those factors so that we can predict the weather. We need a similar system in place for harmful algal blooms. So that's where the monitoring comes in. Uh, as far as the long-term effects of eating uh, fish that can be contaminated with brevitoxin, is that was the first question of that? Uh, that's correct. Okay, so as soon as you eat it once, uh, neurotoxic shellfish poisoning will probably it probably won't happen again. However, the chronic exposure to the aerosols, a lot of people are, are concerned about, and uh, immunology studies have been, have been done with no, uh, with no direct um, results to long-term effects. Uh, more research must be done, and I think the, the thing that makes it really tough with doing human exposure studies with something that you're not exposed to constantly is that red tide blooms, they, they happen um, and then they go away. And so to get someone that is chronically exposed consistently, um, I think is very difficult. Uh, well, obviously. Um, so, so perhaps that's part of the problem um, with getting that, that long-term analysis. I know that we were looking at doing a long-term study with University of Florida on, uh, on uh, the lungs. Um, to see what kind of long-term lung effect uh, exposure to brevitoxin might have. Um, and we're excited about that and looking for a grant opportunity to actually write that proposal. But as far as immunology, I wouldn't be the person to ask. Another seems to do with uh, transparency. Uh, so the question is, and again, I think this would be for the district, are environmental resource permits for the lake adjacent businesses available to the public? So in essence, if someone's here talking about the extensive permitting process that folks go through, does the public have an opportunity to review those and see those to be able to understand more fully what's taking place? Absolutely. Um, there's a, the process as the, we're going through the actual permitting process, the public has an opportunity to, to provide input. They have an opportunity to challenge that and, and uh, take it to court if necessary. Uh, all of the, uh, the, the applications, the permit uh, applications, the correspondence going back and forth, as well as the permit and monitoring reports associated with each project is posted out on our webpage so the public can go and take a look. We've got a pretty simple GIS map that you can go actually click on 
on a piece of property and look at the permit itself. That's our environmental resource permit as well as consumptive use permit as well. So. Uh, another that I, I found interesting is uh, did the BP oil spill have anything to do with uh, the red tide and the fact that it's lasting longer? Does, is there any connection or studies that have been done on that? I can answer that, and then we have seen no interaction of the BP oil spill with the red tide. That was simple enough. <laughs> Since we have you all here together, one of the questions is, uh, how, has, how do you guys work uh, regionally? Because this is a regional issue, obviously, as we're looking at and stand back and take a look at the big picture. How does the studies that you all are doing interrelate so that there's a more full comprehensive plan rather than sometimes people feel it's kind of piecemeal. So uh, can you, someone take a look and talk in terms of what's the interaction, interagency action to be able to help solve this problem? Yes, at Mobile Marine Laboratory, we work very closely with the state of Florida, not only the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, but also with DAX and uh, also uh, DEP and especially the health department. Uh, our scientists have weekly uh, conference calls with several of the agencies uh, just to keep up right now, just especially just to keep up with what's going on. Uh, and we also work with the federal agencies. We have interactions with NOAA. Our data that we obtain uh, on a weekly basis, actually, and on a daily basis in some areas. PCRS is given to NOAA daily. Oh, okay, yeah, they, they go to the state as well as to federal agencies, and we have feedback from them. And we also interact a lot with our colleagues at universities and other, other uh, research institutions. So there's a, a tremendous interaction and networking, and I think Florida is recognized almost worldwide as one of the most uh, advanced uh, networking agencies and monitoring agencies and public information outreach for harmful algal blooms. Uh, one of the things we've seen is the beach cleanup. Clearly, you know, we're out picking the fish and the dead uh, animals off the beaches. One of the questions is, why can't we skim the red tide, similar to what they did with BP oil spills? So there's a collection process. Is there anyone that can speak to why that seems not to be doable? Well, the, uh, just the feasibility of it would probably prohibit it to some degree. If you look at the current bloom and it's it's actually probably larger than when I last measured it from some satellite data, but it covers, uh, well, roughly about 1.5 trillion gallons of water. So to skim that much water, not to mention that the cells are constantly being replaced. It's not that like the cells are there and they're just one cell and it stays there and eventually dies. The cells are dividing and they're potentially being replaced from underneath as well, um, from new cells being brought into the system. So it probably wouldn't be effective, not to mention it'd be very difficult to filter out a a cell that's uh, about 30 microns <laughs> large. But uh, also the organism goes from surface to bottom. Right, the organism moves it's through the water the column. It's not always at the surface. Sometimes it's at the bottom at higher concentrations on the surface. Uh, another question that we got, uh, again, grouping some things together around health issue is uh, air quality. Uh, there was a question because of the number of dead fish, uh, the actual odor that's released. You had talked about that a little bit in your presentation. It, what process, if any, uh, has there been as far as being able to understand how this affects respiratory issues that folks may have who are living in the proximity of this event? Is there any data or is there anyone that you know that might be working on that? Yes, Moat did a study uh, with several other institutions uh, with the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences uh, specifically for the effect on respiratory irritation and respiratory function. Uh, we, we found out, of course, that in collecting the, the toxins in the air, we collected up to a mile inland and, and it was still detectable there. Anecdotally, I've heard that it, people are experiencing the effects of an aerosol red tide toxins as much as 18, 20 miles inland. Um, we haven't measured that, so I don't have any empirical evidence, but from what people are saying, uh, it, I would not be surprised. Actually, your nose is probably a more sensitive instrument than the best one that we have in terms of detecting the presence of the red tide toxin. Uh, I'll, I have to defer to the health department experts on any long-term effects or what is known about. 
We do know that during a red tide that the incidence of respiratory, respiratory problems and asthmatic attacks does increase. That has been documented. Uh, this may be outside of your wheelhouse, but I'll ask it anyway, and it goes back to, I think, the safety of health issue. But there's also an economic component to this as well that, that all of us recognize as to what it's doing to local businesses, uh, to the tourism industry, as people read about the effects of this. So, so one of the questions that's being asked is uh, fish stocks, for example. So, so we understand what's taking place in the marine atmosphere. Uh, are we working with fish and wildlife, or is there any other connection that's being made as to how this is actually affecting the fish stocks over time and what it is as citizens we should be alerted to as, A, the wind blows out, so therefore the fishermen may want to be closer, but then there's this residual effect that may be taking place. How is it that they should be thinking in terms of what their future looks like while this event's taking place? Yeah. Um, it probably is a little bit outside of the wheelhouse of uh, the group yeah, of us that's yeah. here now. Um, we do have some fisheries experts at, at Moat. Um, however, that, that's a great question, and the, the long-term ecological impact on these fish populations is, especially for a bloom this large, both in, in terms of, uh, of length of time as well as the overall area, is something to be concerned about and something to, to um, research. And at Moat, some of the uh, emergency funds that are coming to Moat are being used to look at a particular fish, the, the snook, and um, what the potential impact might be of this bloom on, on the uh, snook populations, because it happened to hit at a time when the snook are undergoing their, their uh, uh, summer reproduction. And so there are some uh, mortality and stock assessment studies to try to inform what might be done to try to enhance the stocks after the bloom to help them recover. And similar studies could likely be done with uh, many other fish species as well. I, I might add maybe a, a positive note for people who like uh, shrimp and crabs. It does appear that after a heavy red tide period, for a year or two after that, the population of shrimp and crabs seems to increase considerably. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to digest that one a little bit. Uh, <laughs> one, one, oh, hey, I didn't mean it that way. But one, one, one of the, uh, uh, I'm going to go back to, to the monitoring and notification because clearly uh, local governments, and, and we had quite a few officials here from, from cities and counties, et cetera. Uh, what, what advice would you give uh, for us to be able to do a better job of being able to alert the public as to how it is that we respond to beach closures, uh, to the ebb and flow, pun intended, uh, of what's taking place here, uh, to be able to have our citizens more uh, in tune as to what they should and should not do and what we should and should not be saying. I know you had a, a series of slides that talked about you know, that communications component. Yeah, so we have the visit visitbeaches.org. It's also a free smartphone app available on iTunes and Android for people to check uh, twice daily reports. And then of course we have CSIC, which um, those citizen science reports do end up on a map. Um, in addition to that, FWC, NOAA, um, USF, um, we, we all have information to help, help people make those healthy decisions when choosing a beach. Conditions can change really quickly, winds change, um, there might be effects at one side of the beach and not another, or at one beach and not a beach a mile south. And we want people coming to Florida to have positive experiences when they come to a beach. So getting this information to the public um, and to visitors that are coming down here um, to help them make those decisions of what beach to go to um, is the same thing for, for direct. Now, we don't do beach closures. We're just scientists. Um, but but this information that we have and, and is constantly growing, hopefully that will help them make those decisions. Uh, uh, let me cycle back to uh, one of the, uh, again, themes that comes up often in talking in terms of uh, nutrient pollution and the origins and source of those. Clearly people feel that Lake Okeechobee is a contributor at some level to some basins, but if you could, at least from the South Florida Water Management District's aspect, talk specifically about Collier, uh, and review again the watershed that we have, which is distinct uh, from the rest of South Florida and Southwest Florida, and what are the contributing factors as we try to deal with this issue at the local level? 
Well, I don't have the facts and figures about nutrient and the loading and such in the in in Collier uh, here with me, but, uh, but I'm I'm certain that we have that information can make that make that available to to the public if they like. But but yeah, the, the the watershed here in Collier County is completely distinct, not connected it whatsoever to Lake Okeechobee uh, or the or the Caloosahatchee. So you have your own very very separate basin over there, which captures the rainfall and, and largely uh, sheet flows it down across uh, to the to the estuaries to the west and southwest. Uh, but but what can you do? You know, as as Dr. as Dr. Uh, Fenera said, I, I'm sorry. No, the the question was asked, and, and, and oh, 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 hold on, please. We, we've been doing very well. So, the, the, no, what he said is. Uh, no, I, I understand, but oh. what, what is being said, and, and I think it's an, important, it's an important point, is that Collier County, and you can correct me where I go awry, is a distinct basin. The water does not flow from Lake Okeechobee here, and what happens in Lee County, unfortunately for them, stays in Lee County. So, uh, well, I, I understand, ma'am, and offline you can have a conversation with the Water Management District and the Big Cypress Basin District to understand the watersheds and flows, but that is the reason why we have this informational meeting so that you can understand the scientific nature of what it is that we're dealing with. There are some issues that we have to deal with locally, which is what they're talking about, fertilizer and the impairment that we have to our water systems, and that's what we're trying to handle through our stormwater program. But the bigger picture of how the basins work, how the water flows, I think we've got a very good, at least initial understanding, and I'm quite sure that these folks will be available shortly after the program. I know the Colonel will need to leave, but at least there's a better, I think, basis for being able to understand where our challenges are. With that, yeah, I'd like to bring up, uh, oh, Dr. Mitch, yes, you didn't yeah, have a chance to Yeah, can I make a quick comment on that? Sure enough. I, I live and work in Collier County. Uh, my office is there, and we've, done a lot of collaboration with the county, especially on an area known as Freedom Park, which a lot of people don't even know it exists in. But years ago, well, not years ago, less, less than a decade ago, uh, Collier County made an investment and built treatment wetlands in the Gordon River system. Now, the Gordon River is one of the main watersheds that you have in, in uh, Collier County, and, and it's got its share of pollution. But I will propose to you that perhaps we have maybe a little less pollution in Naples Bay and a little less red tide in the coastal waters because of that um, intelligence of the uh, county managers to build these treatment wetlands and put them on the Gordon River and, uh, you know, this was not an experiment. In other words, we didn't have two basins, but I contend that those had to do a lot of good with regard to improving water quality in the uh, Naples Bay and in the uh, coastal waters. So you did, Collier County, you did the right thing. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, again bring up Commissioner Taylor for at least a closing remark. I know we could probably sit here and learn so much more. It's been uh, it's been such an honor to hear you. It's it's been a uh, like being in a university in a classroom. And thank you for this. Thank you for making the trip. I think it speaks a lot of the core that they came. I think it speaks a lot of South Florida Water Management that they came and served. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to figure this out with these minds and with Dr. Mitch. We're going to figure this out. We just have to work together. I really appreciate your respect you gave these speakers, the way you conducted yourself. And please, we have a sign-in sheet out there. We have our cards. If we need to do another symposium, we will. And please know that your government is engaged in this. We're not ignoring this. And thank you very much, and drive home safely. You're watching Collier Television, bringing government home. True definition of hero. you been a hero. Took a heroic effort. Every day we bring to our fans the world of sports. 
We speak of heroes and heroism, but there are days when sports matter little and heroes matter more. These heroes don't hit walk-off homers or buzzer-beating threes. They simply made a plan for what to do when disaster strikes. You never know when you might need to be the hero because you never know if today is the day before a natural disaster. Prepare, plan, be a hero. Visit ready.gov.